This is the story of Seo Jun, where he grew stronger by farming and evolving his pets by giving them his special juice, making them thick. Oh, I mean, thick. What the? This episode begins in Seo Jun's cave, where everyone has resumed their duties. The mother rabbit and her daughter, Sickle Rabbit, are busy harvesting green onion stems, while the baby rabbits transport them away. The father rabbit diligently waters plants with his golden watering can, while Seo Jun focuses on the magical cherry tomatoes, which look as if they've jumped out of a ketchup advertisement. Seo Jun informs Sickle Rabbit and the Queen Bee that he plans to leave the cave for an extended period, so he wants to harvest as much as possible before his departure. Engaged in intense harvesting, Seo Jun starts feeling quite hot and sweaty, prompting him to ask the Queen Bee to hold his hat for a while. Eager to be helpful, the Queen Bee happily agreed. As Seo Jun continues to harvest tomatoes with his named dagger, cutting several at once, a system message suddenly appears, announcing that he has successfully harvested nine perfectly ripe cherry tomatoes simultaneously. Moreover, he has leveled up from a D-grade to a C-grade tower farmer. Stunned by this update, Seo Jun is in disbelief as he reads the message. He had been so focused on his work over the past few days that he hadn't noticed how close he was to leveling up. The system further explains that as his job grade improves, his job characteristics are enhanced, bringing him closer to nature and unlocking his hidden talents. Seo Jun can hardly believe what he's reading, but before he can react further, the system notifies him that he has gained the skill Friend of Nature. With this new ability, Seo Jun can now communicate with every entity in the tower, from monsters to even plants. While still processing everything, Seo Jun tests his new skill by speaking with the father rabbit, who is also harvesting crops. To Seo Jun's astonishment, he understands what the father rabbit is saying. Shocked by this revelation, Seo Jun falls on his butt, gasping and exclaiming in disbelief. After that, Seo Jun started thinking about the games he used to play on his pro gaming console, which you guys can also win. Not only that, there will also be Amazon gift cards with a total value of $10,000. Plus, there are lots of other in-game prizes. Here's how you can win. Simply download Raid, Shadow Legends from the QR code on the screen or the link in the description, and dive into this fantasy world where you can collect all kinds of epic champions. Inside Raid, they are celebrating the arrival of spring in Teleria, with a special Spring Hunt minigame event starting from April 15th to May 30th, where you will need to find hidden items around Mistwood. Then head to https trowingspringhunt.plarium.com. Enter your raid ID and start searching for missing items. Once completed, you could win those amazing gaming consoles and gifts worth $10,000. But that's not the end. There are also Community Weeks, which feature multiple in-game activities for all players and a 14-day loyalty program that gives away a free legendary champion, Chronicler Adeline. To get Adeline, just log in for seven days between April 11th and July 8th. I must say, she is one of my favorite champions. Lastly, by joining with my link, you will immediately receive a huge starter pack with an epic champion, Tayrell, from the High Elves faction, and you'll get another starter pack after reaching level 25 with an epic Rector Drath. After downloading the game, use promo code SPRINGHUNT24 to get silver and more. And you can also join my clan Asura Recaps and we can play together. So just hit my link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. Now let's continue to the video. Then Seo Jun quickly gets up to ask the father rabbit to repeat what he had just said. The father rabbit, confused, looks on as Sickle Rabbit approaches and calls Seo Jun, uncle, inquiring if anything is wrong. Excited, Seo Jun immediately starts cuddling with Sickle Rabbit and asks her to call him uncle again. However, this annoys Sickle Rabbit, who sternly tells Seo Jun to step back or he will slash him. This comment makes Seo Jun a little angry, and while gently setting Sickle Rabbit down, Seo Jun warns him not to slash or he might get another bald spot. Realizing that Seo Jun understood him, Sickle Rabbit, along with the Father Rabbit, is struck by the revelation. 
Seo Jun proudly clears their doubts and reveals that he has awakened a new talent that allows him to communicate with animals. Sickle Rabbit and the Father Rabbit are thrilled by this news and quickly gather everyone around. When they announce that Seo Jun can understand them, initially, no one believes it. The Mother Rabbit immediately questions her husband, asking if Seo Jun had picked up and eaten something strange. The Father Rabbit panics and assures her that he did nothing of the sort. Seo Jun quickly interjects, assuring her that he hasn't picked up or eaten anything out of the ordinary, and asks the mother rabbit if she doesn't trust him. Hearing this, the mother rabbit finally realizes that Seo Jun indeed can understand everyone. The warrior rabbit, with great joy, jumps into Seo Jun's arms, calling him uncle and eagerly asking if he really understands them. He expresses his desire to talk about so many things with his uncle. Seo Jun sits on the ground, holding the black rabbit in his palm, and addresses all his nephews and nieces. The black rabbit, the watering rabbit, the shovel rabbit, the cart rabbit, and sickle rabbit. He acknowledges that the communication barrier has frustrated everyone, and now that it has been removed, they should discuss everything they couldn't before. Everyone cheers for Seo Jun. Next, the Queen Bee nervously approaches Seo Jun and anxiously asks if he can understand her too. Seo Jun gently pats her head, confirming that he can clearly hear and understand her now. The Queen Poison Bee is overjoyed and immediately drops the hat as she rushes to hug Seo Jun. The army of their children follows her lead, causing Seo Jun to fall to the ground as all the baby bees and the mother bee happily hug and snuggle with him. After everyone calms down, Seo Jun gets up and decides that he should share this good news with the people outside the cave, too. The father rabbit hands him his hat, and Seo Jun thanks him as he puts it on. Suddenly, he receives another system message, informing him that the straw hat has also advanced to rank C alongside his promotion, flooding his vision with numerous new skill. All the skills he acquired from the hat, including protection of Mother Earth, farmer's body, and wishing for a good harvest, have been freed from their restrictions and leveled up. Additionally, Seo Jun has received a new skill from his hat, Growth Promoter Level 1. Curious about the newly acquired skill, he taps it to find detail. It is an active skill that boosts the growth rate of 10 crops for a week without any side effects. The cooldown time between using this skill is 10 days. Seo Jun exclaims, that the effect of the growth promoter skill is awesome. He gets an idea about how to use it and goes outside the cave. Seo Jun plants a few sprouts of the special crop he has not harvested even once, the sweet potato sun pumpkin. He plants the sprouts in the ground and, as usual, gains some job experience and skill proficiency from them, and his skill, sowing level 3, increases the probability of the sweet potatoes taking root. Seo Jun then uses his growth promoter skill on the plants, and a golden light covers them. The system informs him that the growth rate of the sweet potatoes will increase for one week. Seo Jun is pleased to hear that. He had been waiting for the right time to plant the sweet potato sun pumpkin outside the cave and got the perfect chance thanks to his new skill. Seo Jun believes that using the growth promoter skill, the plants will take root quickly and become more stable. Since there is not much safe space on his outdoor farm, he simply plants them near the green onions and thinks that it should be okay. To his surprise, the green onions planted next to them suddenly start glowing and the sweet potato, sun pumpkin plants begin vibrating like an old Nokia phone. Then, in an instant, they suddenly grow large, leaving Seo Jun surprised by the rapid growth rate. He wonders if this is merely the effect of the growth promoter skill, but the system corrects him. The skill, wishing for a good harvest, was activated on the green onion field, and its energy inadvertently seeped into the sweet potato sun pumpkins as well. Consequently, the yield of the sweet potatoes also increases by 50% until the effect on the green onions subside. Seo Jun thanks the god of plot armor for this double buff and exclaims that now they can harvest the sweet potatoes even faster. Just then, he hears the baby bear scream and turns around to find that the baby crimson bear is about to pounce on him while shouting, Dad! as he jumps. 
Our poor MC can only scream in horror. They fall to the ground, and the bear cub once again calls Seo Jun dad, asking if what the rabbit said is true and if he can understand him now. Seo Jun is still trying to process that the baby bear thinks he is his dad, while the bear cub affectionately licks his face. Seo Jun then suddenly shouts that he is not anyone's dad. In fact, he is a pitiful virgin who has never even dated a girl. Seo Jun turns to the baby bear's mom and asks if she is okay with what her son is doing. She first expresses her surprise that he can really hear them. After that, she says she actually likes that her son calls Seo Jun his dad because he is the perfect man in her eye. She thanks Seo Jun for taking her and her son under his care, leaving the pushover of a man no choice. So with this, Seo Jun now has two Weifus. He then starts to cuddle his newfound son while the baby bear tells Seo Jun that he is really hungry and wants to eat some of the queen bee's juice and Seo Jun's thick onion grass. This excites Seo Jun as he also wanted to eat them and tells the baby bear to wait while he thinks today he will make something special for his newfound son. The next moment we see Seo Jun harvesting some sweet potatoes. The information window labels them as strength potatoes that are nutritious and delicious, an absolute necessity for any gym bro because Seo Jun's grade reached C. The rank of the potatoes he harvested is also C. When consumed, the potatoes break down 30 grain of fat in the body and even increase strength by 0.5 for 10 minutes and this effect can be stacked up to 10 times per hour. The shelf life of the crop is 90 days. Then, Seo Jun simply steams the potatoes in a huge container and then announces that it is time to eat. In the meantime, the rabbits have prepared other food items like roasted fish and corn. Everyone sits down happily to eat, and Seo Jun thinks that this day is worth including in his diary of getting lost in the tower. He believes that only good things will happen to him from now on. After some time, we see everyone gathering outside the cave, with the baby bear crying his lungs out, insisting on going with Seo Jun. While his mom tries to calm him down, Seo Jun is ignoring him completely and asking Theo if he loaded his bundle with a lot of green onion plants. Theo affirms, stating that he has packed his bundle full thanks to the help of the wolf employees. After that, Seo Jun turns his attention to the bear cub and asks if he is going to act so childishly. He asks the bear cub what he told him as his dad just now, and with tears in his eyes, the cub replies that Seo Jun told him to stay behind and protect his queen bee sister. The queen bee and one of her kids are sitting on his head as he says this. Then, Seo Jun asks him if he is going to keep kicking up a fuss even after those instructions and the baby bear finally agrees to calm down. But in return, he wants Seo Jun to promise that he will return from his journey soon. Seo Jun touches his forehead to the baby bears and tells him that he will return as soon as possible. He asks the baby bear if he can trust in his dad and wait, and he nods like a little baby. With that, the leader of the wolves calls Seo Jun the Great Black Dragon and tells him that he will escort him now. Seo Jun rides on the wolf's back along with the black warrior rabbit, and Theo rides on his shoulder. It reminds me of the scene where Naruto was on top of a pyramid of toad. He also tells the Minotaur couple, ox number three and cow number four, that it is time to depart to the waypoint where the Minotaur King is. They start their journey with the baby bear, waving them goodbye in the back. Thanks to the fast, sprinting speed of the wolf chief, they quickly cover the vast distance between Seo Jun's field and the Minotaur territory. Seo Jun compliments Elka on his speed, but Theo and the Black Warrior Rabbit have their eyes covered because of the strong dust. Suddenly, Seo Jun spots a dark and eerie patch of hills in front of him and asks what that is. On first sight, it appears like a forest, but it is incredibly and unnaturally dark, almost like my future. Ox number three replies that it is the place where the jerks are, but that is not much of an explanation. Cow number four seems to be both the smarter and the sharper one of the two, and she tells Seo Jun about the dark area in detail. She explains that even on the 99th floor, there are many territories. The territory they are going towards belongs to the Minotaurs, 
while the area where Seo Jun's farm is, is the territory of the Mama Bear, a.k.a. the Red Fur. As for the Dark Forest, it is the territory of someone called the Corrupt Beings of the West. Seo Jun is curious about them, but Cow Number 4 doesn't tell him much apart from the fact that they were not always corrupt. She tells Seo Jun that right now it is not good for him to know about the details or to go near the place. She explains that the place is dangerous and urges him not to go anywhere near it. Seo Jun is curious about the corrupt beings and thinks that he will ask Aileen about this in detail later. They take the long way to avoid the dark patch, and then suddenly, a ball of mud hits Seo Jun in the face with such great force that it throws him off his ride. Everyone is worried about him. Theo is the first to react, followed by Ox Number 3, who asks him if he is all right, and then by Elka, who is terrified that someone dared hit the Great Black Dragon. Seo Jun gets up and tells everyone that he is fine while wiping the mud from his face. After he looks at the mud on his hands, he looks ahead and finds a herd of minotaurs eating mud. Just seeing it makes me want to puke. But Seo Jun realizes that the minotaurs have to eat mud because there is nothing else to eat in this place. He also understands that this food scarcity is the reason they get so crazy the moment they see anything green. As Seo Jun is still sitting on the ground, the black warrior rabbit joins him and even asks Theo to come down. The cat acts like an entitled brat and declares that he won't come down since he hates stepping on mud. While Elka apologizes to Seo Jun for letting that happen, cow number four takes charge. She asks who dared throw mud at their guest, and a minotaur who looks like he is a bully comes out to greet the couple who have not come home since a long time. He asks them where they have been spending their time so amicably and then notices the guests. He tells Ox number three that he is too weak to bring any toys to this place and asks him to give them to him so that he can play well with them. That earns him a crushing punch to the face from our rainy mountain. The punch sends the bully wannabe spinning in the air before crashing down on his back, and I think this is pretty much what will happen in the Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul fight. With that, Cow Number 4 declares that they have no time and they must immediately go to the Minotaur King. Her boyfriend is just fangirling over her from behind, and I am starting to wonder why someone as good as Cow Number 4 would settle for him. In the meantime, a Minotaur rushed to their king's side to inform him that the Minotaur couple is back but they have brought some strange-looking guys with them. Before the Minotaur King can inquire any further, Ox number three and Cow number four appear before him. They declare that they have arrived with guests from Redfur's territory, and this makes the rest of the Minotaurs a bit anxious. The Minotaur King is relieved that they have come to meet him themselves, as now he doesn't need to waste his precious time going to them. Then he was about to welcome the farm rabbits, as in his perspective, the farm rabbits seem to be the ones growing the grass. But he gets surprised as he notices that the only white thing among them is Seo Jun's t-shirt. The Minotaur King asks if he doesn't look like a white rabbit and inquires who the white-looking creature was. Seo Jun politely introduces himself by his name, but this was the first time for the Minotaur King to see a human, so he thought Seo Jun was the name of a new species. The Minotaur King continued, saying from the looks of it, Seo Jun seems very weak, and if the mama bear was bullying him by forcing him to work, he doesn't have to fear, as he, the Minotaur King, will himself protect him. He states it's his rule to protect the weak from the bully bastards, and he knows for a fact that the mama bear is a bully. Well, Seo Jun is about to give him a fact check and tell him that he is mistaken about some thing. First, he doesn't work under the mama bear. Instead, she and her baby help him out. Second, he is not here to ask to be saved from unfair treatment, but rather to complain about something. Seo Jun tells the Minotaur King that he is here to get compensated for what he stole from his farm three days ago. Seo Jun tells him with a smug expression that unless he wants to be labeled a thief, he must pay up what he owes him. This made the Minotaur King furious. He doesn't take his words kindly and starts raging at Seo Jun, daring him to say that again. He crushes the rock underneath his feet, asking how dare lowly beings like him accuse him of stealing. He refuses to accept the allegation that the strongest being on the 99th floor, the Minotaur King, 
is a thief. Seo Jun is barely holding his ground in front of the Minotaur King's mighty roar. But even as he keeps his hat from flying away, after settling some time, Seo Jun, also furious, starts to shout at the Minotaur King, asking if he is not a thief. Then was it his ghost that came to his farm and stole the onion leaves? Upon hearing his words, the other Minotaur start doubting if the human is telling the truth. They wonder if their boss really stole the grass they ate three days ago. Seeing them question him, the Minotaur King does a 180 on his stand and tells Seo Jun that there seems to be a misunderstanding. So, with a polite tone, the Minotaur King began to make excuses, saying he can only travel far from the waypoint for only a few hours and he didn't have much time to talk. As his whole clan was on the brink of destruction from hunger, he took the grass, but he was obviously going to pay Seo Jun back after all. He is the boss of the 99th floor. The Minotaur King was still a bit nervous about his answer and just laughed to hide it. He then asks Seo Jun what his wish is so that he can fulfill it. He is ready to give him rare or legendary grade items, but Seo Jun is not interested in any of those. Instead, he asks the Minotaur King if he can let him use the waypoint. The Minotaur King is taken aback and asks him to repeat, and Seo Jun says that the price he wishes for is being allowed to use the waypoint. Well, the Minotaur King thinks that it is acceptable and decides to honor Seo Jun's wishes. He calls him forth to fulfill his desires, and Seo Jun is extremely happy that he will finally get out of the tower. He climbs on the platform and walks towards the waypoint, dreaming of going outside. He notices the giant floating crystal and reaches towards it. As Seo Jun touches it, suddenly the system notified Seo Jun that as he never saved any waypoint in the entire tower, and this is his first waypoint, Seo Jun first has to save another waypoint to fast travel. Well, this shook Seo Jun's entire world. He really thought he would finally be able to get out of the tower. The Minotaur King started to explain that it is because Seo Jun is someone who was not born inside the tower. He doesn't know how Seo Jun came to the 99th floor, but the rule of the tower states that all external entities must register themselves on the waypoints at each floor, starting from the first floor. That is the only way to go outside for someone who was not born inside the tower. The Minotaur King tells Seo Jun that with only the 99th floor on his list, he is not eligible to go to another floor. That was enough to break him down, and Seo Jun falls to his knees as his hope to escape the tower is shattered. Theo is worried about him and tries to comfort him, but Seo Jun quickly bounces back from his depression, at least on the outside. He sighs, claiming that ever since he came to know that this place is on the 99th floor, he knew deep down that there would be no way he could use to get out of his place. It still feels a bit sad now that he has confirmed the fact that the Minotaur King is right behind him. He seems to have something else on his mind. He tells Seo Jun that he is sorry about the situation he finds himself in, but their deal is complete. He allowed him to use the waypoint, and he accepted it. The Minotaur King says that because of this, he no longer owes any debt he must repay. Seo Jun, who would go all out against even the tower manager for being greedy in such situations, doesn't even have the energy to fight back. He gets up, telling Seo Jun that indeed he is no longer indebted to him. The Minotaur King wants to take no risks, so he tells Seo Jun to go back now. But he cuts him mid-sentence and suggests making an offer instead. The Minotaur King is furious that an insignificant being like Seo Jun is daring to make him an offer. Well, Seo Jun is not going to be intimidated by it, and he simply asks Theo to open his bundle on his command. The cat merchant leaps off his shoulder and opens his bundle to let a river of freshly harvested green onion leaves flow out of it. The green onion leaves are piled up in one corner of the Minotaur King's platform, and all the overgrown bulls are amazed to see it. They start drooling and panting as they recognize the tasty grass they had a couple of days ago and find it hard to hold back their urges. Even the Minotaur King is sweating as he asks Seo Jun to explain what this is. Seo Jun smugly tells him that this is just a gift to show his goodwill to the Minotaurs. He claims to be doing this with the sole intention of getting along with his neighbors on the 99th floor. The Minotaur King probably couldn't hear anything after Seo Jun said gift, and he has also started drooling because of the grass. 
Seo Jun then suddenly sighs, saying that he is also a bit troubled. He tells the Minotaur King that recently he has been expanding his field, and so he needs a lot of manpower. He says that if they expand the field some more, everyone here can eat this type of delicious grass three times a day. With that, Seo Jun finally comes to his point and winks, while asking the Minotaur King if he would like to make a deal with him now. Meanwhile, outside Seo Jun's cave, the baby bear queuing has become a fat chunk of sadness waiting for his dad to return home. Suddenly, he sees something in the distance that alerts him, as well as the queen poison bee. Seo Jun has returned home, riding on the wolf captain Elka. He waves to King, who immediately dashes to his side, exclaiming that his dad is back. The queen bee and her children also follow him. King starts cuddling with Seo Jun, who asks him if he has been a good boy. The bear cub replies that he was a good boy who didn't even cry. As King is licking his human dad, the father rabbit comes there and remarks that Seo Jun is back rather quickly. He asks if the negotiations went well, and Seo Jun replies that they went really well. He suddenly signals to someone in the distance and begs them to come towards him. Immediately, a group of minotaurs arrive there, stunning the parent rabbits. The minotaurs have heard the gist of their job description from Seo Jun and think that they just have to dig the ground. Seeing his rabbit friend so shocked, Seo Jun explains that these minotaurs will help them plow the field. He reveals that he struck a deal with the Minotaur King and received permission to do whatever he wants with the entire wasteland on the 99th floor. The Minotaurs are raring to go, and they ask Seo Jun where they should start from. Meanwhile, King is fawning over them because he has never seen so many buff gym bros at once before. He approaches the Minotaurs and says that their muscles look really cool. The Minotaurs have heard some details about the bear cub from Ox Number 3, and they remark that he looks more brave than what they had heard. King exclaims that he is really close to Ox Number 3, who is like his respected elder brother. He says that he was the one who guided Ox Number 3 around the field, and he will show all the newcomers, too. King tells the Minotaurs to follow him, and they are quite eager to do so and begin their work right away. SEO Jun can only fawn over King's cuteness as he sees him go, and then he thinks that it is time to prepare some food for the Minotaur workers while the farmer rabbits are eager to join him. Theo is just lazily sleeping on top of the wolf, dreaming about Quengi. The Minotaur King only hopes that believing in Seo Jun is the right choice. He then smirks as he recalls his good neighbor's remarks and predicts that the 99th floor is going to get noisy now. The next day, the queen poison bee gets to work rather early. They spit honey into glass bottles that Theo had bought earlier. It's kind of gross how honey is made, but who cares because it's so sweet. Seo Jun is amazed by the amount of honey the bees have already made because he thought that they would be busy preparing for the blue moon. The queen bee sits on his head while the chunky rabbit loads the honey bottles into his cart and King can only drool looking at the bottles filled with his favorite snack. Seo Jun asks the queen bee if they have increased their numbers recently and she seems quite proud of that. Seo Jun then gives a bottle of honey to King but tells him to eat it sparingly. After that, he turns to the mama bear and asks her if she is going deep inside the forest today. She affirms, stating that she must go somewhere far away since the blue moon is tomorrow. Seo Jun says that in that case, he will pack them a lot of food along with some extra bottles of honey, and King is excited to hear it. Just then, Elka arrives there and addresses Seo Jun as the Great Black Dragon. He nervously tells Seo Jun that the wolves must also go down to their home to face the blue moon. Seo Jun tells him not to worry about anything because he has prepared a meal for them too. Behind him is a literal mountain of crayfish and piranhas among other food items. Seo Jun remarks that the Black Warrior Rabbit made many trips to the Sea of Dimensions to hunt enough seafood for them. The wolves freak out on seeing the large amount of food, and they bow down to thank the Black Rabbit, who tells them that it was no big deal. Then, Seo Jun starts wondering how the wolves will carry this much food. Elka tells him that they also have their simple assisting bundles that can carry a lot of things, even though they cannot be compared to a merchant's bundle. 
The three wolves throw their assisting bundles in the air, and the food gets sucked into it completely. That reminds me of every time I order pizza with my homie. With that, they prepare to take off and tell Seo Jun that they will meet him again after the blue moon ends. Hing and his mom also join them as they are going in the same direction, and Seo Jun waves them goodbye. With the black rabbit by his side, he thinks that since everything else is sorted, he should also start preparing for the blue moon. He looks a bit tense and then immediately propels his biggest simp, tower manager alien, into action. She sends him a message asking if he is worried about his field again. The black warrior rabbit leaves to help his parents and to give his human uncle some privacy. Seo Jun admits that he is a bit uneasy since the blue moon is approaching. Alien asks him, didn't I tell you to trust in me already? She asks him if he didn't see her step in and subdue the monsters during the blue moon for him, and he replies that she did. Whenever the blue moon appears, monsters go berserk. A month ago, during the last blue moon, Seo Jun often thought about it when Ox Number 3 ruined his outside field. Everyone tries to minimize the damage their actions cause by going away from the fields or staying hidden. That works for the fields inside the cave, but the fields outside are still defenseless, and they hold the vast majority of his green onion crop. This time, Seo Jun shared these concerns of his with Alien, and she clearly told him that she would protect the field. He doesn't understand just how she's going to protect the field, but he is now sure that the black dragon he saw during the first blue moon was an alien. He tells her that he believes in her, and the great black dragon is happy to receive praise from her human crush. She tells Seo Jun to believe in her and plant a lot of crop. With that, she starts stretching to begin her own preparations for the blue moon. Alien opens the doors of her cabin and climbs up a huge staircase to reach the top of her tower. On the top floor, there are huge magic stones that look exactly like the waypoint. We then finally see our favorite dragon home, which is a black tower situated on a floating island high above the clouds of the 99th floor, which is even more vast than previously revealed. Alien takes in the refreshing breeze because it has been a long time since she left her room. Wait, so she is like all of us? With that, she begins her preparation. Alien uses her authority as the tower manager and activates the system, turning into the Tony Stark of dragons. Standing in the magic circle and with multiple system windows open in front of her, she declares that it is finally her turn to step in. To keep Seo Jun's field safe, all preparations to endure the blue moon have been made. The rabbits are locked in their cozy homes to stay safe from the effects of the blue moon. Seo Jun has also created a safe spot using rocks to hide a spark of flame within. He is satisfied with his craftsmanship and says that since they only need to protect the embers to keep the fire going, this much will be enough. Suddenly, he hears a crying sound and turns around to find Theo cuddling with the young baby rabbits. Theo is in tears, exclaiming, Who would have thought that the cute yellow baby rabbits are now going to turn into adults? While he is touched by this development, as the cool uncle, Seo Jun is not so pleased by his reaction. Seo Jun assures him that there will be nothing to worry about and gives Theo one special thing for safekeeping. It is a cocoon of another queen poison honeybee, and Theo is quite shocked to see it. Seo Jun explains that just this morning, the queen poison bee left the cocoon for him before sealing her hive. He says that because the beehives have gotten bigger, the number of queen bee cocoons is also increasing. Seo Jun prefers the increasing number of beehives as well, but in moments like this, that becomes a tricky thing to handle. Theo tells him not to worry and promises to keep the cocoon in his soft fur. Just as the cat merchant enters his bundle, the sky turns dark, and Seo Jun realized that the blue moon is here. A few moments after that, the cave echoes with the screams and roars of the baby rabbits that reach maturity under the influence of the blue light. They turn into ferocious monsters briefly, and despite having seen it the last time, Seo Jun can't get used to it, and I fully agree with him. Suddenly, he hears a loud roar coming from outside the cave, and he shuts his ears. He wonders why there are monsters nearby because this shouldn't happen. He wants to see if an alien came here to deal with things, 
But as he walks out into the open area of the cave, he finds the murder rabbits looking at him. Seo Jun is taken aback and he remembers that the last time, the rabbits immediately turned into normal adults rather quickly. He wonders why these rabbits are still looking at him violently. They don't stop at just looking and immediately take a stance to leap at him at any time now. Seo Jun is on the verge of wetting his pants and asks the kids to get it together. They obviously don't listen to him and pounce to attack him. Seo Jun hides his face while screaming, but then suddenly, the black dragon alien flies over the cave. The rabbits freeze where they are, and Seo Joan happily shouts Alien's name as he looks at the sky. There is another unexpected thing happening outside the cave. A weird and creepy tree monster called the Branch Ant has suddenly made its way to Seo Joon's outside field. The monster is berserk because of the blue moon, but then it sees something that makes it question everything. The Branch Ant sees the great black dragon flying in the sky, and it gets so terrified that it immediately runs away. However, the black dragon in the sky is not an alien, but just a hologram. The real alien is in her tower, controlling the hologram using her Iron Man level technology. She laughs while asking whoever may listen, what do you think of my performance? This illusory magic tool was created for her by her grandfather. It is especially helpful during the blue moon, when Alien cannot leave the administrator area, but still wants to keep the monsters in check. On top of that, Alien tweaked the hologram a bit to make it look like her adult version. She can remotely control the hologram over the entire 99th floor. However, it is possible to maintain it effectively only if it is as high as the clouds, and it will disappear if it gets closer to the ground. Alien then giggles to herself, thinking that Seo Jun will think that this is what she really looks like. She is pleased with that and decides to fly the holographic dragon a bit more before the blue moon ends. Back in the cave, Seo Jun is really impressed that the monsters have really gotten quiet ever since Alien appeared. Suddenly, he notices a bright light coming from the murder rabbits, and they instantly transform into fuzzy bundles of cuteness. Seeing the rabbits turn into proper adults comes as a relief to Seo Jun. He hugs them, telling the rabbits how glad he is to see them as adults. But the rabbits he hugs tell him to loosen his grip. The other rabbits call him Uncle, and ask him what happened. Seo Jun would answer their question, but then he sees the blue moonlight hitting his crops and a whole bunch of them sparkling after they absorb it. He is happy and says that they should harvest the blue moon crops soon. He is steaming regular sweet potatoes and the blue sweet potatoes side by side. He lays them out on a giant platter along with some blue cherry tomatoes. Well, some of the blue sweet potatoes are not the normal kind, but actually the Sweet Sun Pumpkin Potatoes, and there are also some blue strength potatoes in the mix. SEO Jun counts them all and says that they harvested 13 blue cherry tomatoes, 3 blue potatoes, and 7 blue sweet potatoes this time. That seems less than the number of glowing plants, but maybe he is just bad at math. SEO Jun thanks Alien for helping him out and presents a bowl of blue moon crops to her. He tells her that the potatoes and sweet potatoes are hot, so she must cool them down before eating. Alien thanks him and also tells Seo Jun to leave all the issues of the blue moon to her in the future as well. With that, she receives his offering as she is lying in her comfy bed. She has covered her wings with pillows and even has a cloth over her eyes because she is tired from operating the hologram. However, she thinks that it is worth it because she got some blue moon crop. Even though the sweet potatoes are comparable to a peanut in her hand, she thinks that she should try out the remedy to cure her dragon heart. She eats one sweet potato and one pumpkin and finds that her heart is really beating again. Unlike the last time when it was abrupt, this time Alien can feel a stable flow of mana. Suddenly, she gets a system message in front of her. Alien wonders what the meaning of the message is as she reads it. It says that the achievement of reproducing the forgotten dish, honey potatoes, has been accomplished. Alien realizes that this can only mean one thing, and she looks into her magic orb to find Seo Jun pouring a generous amount of honey on a blue potato. She is not happy that he is doing this. Alien complains 
How dare he give me only potatoes while he is creating a delicious dish for himself? However, she suddenly gets another system message telling her that she can award the one who accomplished the forgotten dish achievement with a special job skill. Alien laughs to herself, thinking that she will give Seo Jun something that is perfect for the tower farmer. Back at the cave, Seo Jun's special dish has been completed. Other than the taste enhanced by the energy of the blue moon, this special dish can increase the mana of the person eating it by 0.3 points. Seo Jun says that potatoes with honey are as delicious as potatoes with salt. He wants to eat it and the rabbits are drooling over the dish too. However, one of the responsible rabbits comes in between Seo Jun and the other rabbits. He reminds them of what their dad said. They have been told to yield all the blue moon crop to Seo Jun. The other rabbits ask him why they should do that, and he replies that it is because Seo Jun is weak. Seo Jun gets serious emotional damage on hearing this, and he cries as he apologizes to the rabbits for being weak. The rabbits encourage him to eat the blue potatoes and say that they will just eat the normal potatoes and sweet potatoes. Seo Jun shamelessly takes the offer and takes a bite out of the honey potato. He feels that he will get addicted to this wonderful taste, while the system window tells him that his mana has been permanently increased by 0.3. Suddenly, he gets another system window in front of him that tells him that he has completed the achievement of reproducing the forgotten dish, honey potato. Seo Jun can only wonder what it is about and asks if he really got an achievement for putting honey on a steamed potato. He gets a message from Alien saying that she nods her head while looking at Seo Jun, who has completed a wonderful achievement. She immediately issues a new quest to Seo Jun, asking him to treat the tower manager to the honey potato. The reward is a job skill, and the penalty for refusing is the disappointment of the tower manager, who says she won't show it. Seo Jun still finds it hard to believe that all this is happening just because he put some honey on a steamed potato. However, since he is curious about the job skill, he accepts the quest. He asks Alien if he can make the dish with a normal potato instead, and apparently her answer is positive because that is what he does. Seo Jun pours honey over a bowl of normal potatoes and gives them to Alien, completing his quest. The skill he acquires as a reward is cooking level one. The description says that the taste and effectiveness of the dishes made using ingredients grown in the tower are slightly improved. SEO Jun is shocked to read that he has cooking skills. Even the tower system said, let him cook. Another screen pops up in front of him, displaying the list of registered recipes. There is only one recipe in there, and it is the honey potato. The description just talks about how the dish is extra tasty and how it increases 0.3 mana permanently as a result of the skill cooking level 1. Seo Jun gets a very small mana boost, which is too small to be displayed on screen. The grade of the dish is C, and its shelf life is one day. Seo Jun asks if he can gather recipes, saying that he is not even surprised now. He wonders if he should choose being a chef as his side job after becoming a farmer. But first, Seo Jun decides to make more honey potatoes for everyone to eat. He asks the rabbits if they will help him, and they are eager to do so. With this, Seo Jun finds an event worth mentioning in his diary of getting lost in the tower. In the western part of the 99th floor, which is the dark forest where the corrupted beings live, a lone branch is sneakily walking back. It is the same tree monster that approached Seo Jun's farm earlier, but was scared off by Alien. Now, as the tiny branch end walks silently, it accidentally trips on a root protruding from the ground and falls. However, it is not just an ordinary root, and the poor little tree monster is going to learn it the hard way. A giant, menacing wooden claw comes towards it, and the confused branch is captured by it. It struggles and screeches to be freed, but all is in vain because it is not strong enough to free itself from the grip of whatever creature is holding it. Then, suddenly, the giant claw smashes the branch end to the ground, crushing it entirely. It turns out that the giant claw belonged to a huge tree monster called the Corrupted Ant, which is what the Minotaurs cryptically warned Seo Jun about earlier. The corrupted ant, which is like a dead and dry tree with multiple red eyes in the hollow cavity of its trunk, immediately starts running deeper into the forest. The blue moon is passing away, 
and as the sun returns to its former glory in the sky, the ant tries to get away from its light. It is not alone because there are many other corrupted ants in the forest, each as menacing as the last one. On the other hand, Seo Jun is peacefully enjoying lunch and tea with his rabbit friend, and he has not noticed a small sapling growing out from underneath the burnt green onion leaf. What can it be? Only time will tell. On the other hand, Elka and his two subordinates are back with their tribe on the 75th floor. Everyone is happy because there is a pile of food in front of them, and Elka is distributing it. He gives a fish to a baby wolf who thanks him and then gets ready to leave. Another wolf asks him if he is going to leave right away, and he replies that he must leave since the blue moon is over. It turns out that the second wolf is Elka's wife, and she asks him to stay a little longer so that his kids can see his face when they wake up. Even a fictional wolf mercenary has a wife and kids, and here I am, as single as can be. Elka just holds his wife's hand, telling her that now he serves the great black dragon, so he cannot afford to waste any time. He promises to be back soon, and with that, he leaves for the 99th floor along with his trusted partner. At the same time, in the passageway village, someone is in a great hurry as they run from their pursuer. The people in the street can only stare at them with curiosity as three gray rabbits are running for their lives. One of them is slow and left behind, and while he asks his friends to stop, their pursuers catch up to them. The pursuer, who is a jackal mercenary, slaps the rabbit into the air, and his partner blocks the path of the other two rabbits. They are terrified and gasp as they are cornered, but their screams reach the sensitive ears of Elka. He turns around to see where it is coming from, while his underlings ask him if they are not leaving. Meanwhile, the jackal mercenary has caught a rabbit by its throat and calls him a slave, asking where he was running off to. Another rabbit is under his foot, and he asks the first rabbit if he has any idea how many floors they have climbed to catch them. The second jackal laughs at the audacity of the rabbits to think that they could outrun them, before suggesting that they should have rabbit meat tonight. He laughs, saying that their boss won't find out if only one rabbit is missing. The jackal opens its mouth wide, and the rabbit in his hands has already accepted its fate. However, just then, a heavy punch hits the jackal's head, forcing his mouth shut. The hit from Elka sends the jackal crashing into the ground, and the wolf chieftain catches the rabbit in his hand. The other jackal recognizes Elka as Grid's subordinate and nervously asks him why he is attacking them. He claims that they are chasers who are out to capture runaway slaves and tells Elka that if Landlord Grid finds out about this, he won't be pleased. Elka simply replies that he doesn't care if they snitch on the fat wild boar or not. He threatens the jackal to get lost before he bites his throat off with his sharp fang. The jackal is terrified, so he drops the rabbits, picks up his injured partner, and struts away from the place. In the meantime, Elka's subordinates have also arrived on the scene, and they are concerned that he did something unnecessary. He apologizes, saying that he couldn't help it. The third wolf then asks him what they should do about the rabbits, because if they leave them here, the jackals may return to capture them. The rabbits are too terrified of them and can only cower in fear on the floor. Elka sighs as he decides to take them along for now because they can be of some help to the Great Black Dragon, which is who he thinks Seo Jun is. For those of you who might have forgotten, this is happening on the 99th floor. Seo Jun has gathered everyone for a big announcement. He proudly declares that after eating the blue moon crops recently, his mana finally reached 10. Well, no one is too impressed by that rookie figure. And Theo, who just woke up and chose violence, asks Seo Jun if that is something to boast about. Seo Jun is flustered as he tells him not to interrupt him in between. He then announces that now he can eat the insides of the eel and obtain the new skill within it. Theo is in a savage mood today, and he yawns as he asks if he can go to sleep now. Seo Jun yells at him to go to sleep after seeing his new skill. He eats the insides of the eel, which are quite delicious and taste like orange soda. After he is done eating it, a system window pops up in front of him, telling him that he has learned the skill Rain and Thunder, level 1. But since he lacks a significant amount of mana to use the skill properly, it is still locked. 
The two sub-skills under his skill, namely Make It Rain and Throw Thunder, have been sealed for the safety of the user. For now, the only part available to Seojun is to make dark clouds according to his mana, and if the environment is right, there is a low probability of rain. Seo Jun freaks out at the system and asks if this is a skill or an iPhone that he has to buy a separate charger. He asks how it is rain and thunder if both rain and thunder are sealed. He then decides to check out whatever is available to him and uses his power to create clouds. Suddenly, the moisture in the air takes the shape of a cloud, but it is a teeny tiny cloud that covers about as much area as a normal person. While everyone else, including Seo Jun, is disappointed, King is impressed and claps for his dad's performance. Seo Jun is so depressed that he used one third of his total mana, but the result was so small. The rabbits have had enough of his lame show and declare that they are going back to work. Theopathy comes there and tells Seo Jun that he is cool because his magic covers the sun. He tells him that it will get bigger later, and Seo Jun is moved to tears because of this. He hugs the bear cub, saying that, as expected, he is the only one for him. On the other hand, Theo is still trolling Seo Jun. He lays on his lap and tells him that it is a good thing that the sun is not bothering him like this. He also asks Seo Jun to move the cloud a bit to the side to properly cover him. Seo Jun finds him annoying and puts him down when suddenly Elka and his crew return. Seo Jun welcomes them back, but then he notices some unexpected guests with them. He is curious about the three shivering rabbits in front of them and asks who these guys are. The ragged and tired rabbits are on the verge of crying and they beg Seo Jun not to eat them. I'm not saying that I am going vegan, but seeing these rabbits, I at least get the point that vegans are trying to make. Seo Jun is also worried about the rabbits who seem to be injured all over. He asks Elka where he picked them up, and the wolf chieftain hesitates to tell him the full story, because he is not yet sure how Seo Jun will react to it. But before that can happen, the mother rabbit comes there and drops her tool as she sees the gray rabbits. The father rabbit is also there, and he is as shocked as his wife. He screams at the rabbits that they are still alive, and the gray rabbits finally see a ray of hope. They call the father rabbit their uncle and run towards him and his wife. That's a K-drama level. Family reunion as the rabbit couple and the gray rabbits have an emotional reunion. Seo Jun is left puzzled, curious about their shared history. Meanwhile, Seo Jun and all his friends watch the gray rabbit devour food with a look of utter surprise on their faces. The reason behind this is that the gray rabbit is eating as if it hasn't eaten anything in a long time, which seems to be quite close to reality. One rabbit is so hasty in eating carrots that one gets stuck in his throat, and he starts coughing. The mother rabbit offers him some water, while Seo Jun tells the gray rabbits to slow down and take their time, because their food is not going to run away from them. The gray rabbit thanks Seo Jun while chugging water, calling him the great black dragon because that is what he learned from the wolves. Seo Jun simply asks the rabbit to call him just by his name, and Elka panics upon hearing that. Seo Jun makes up a reason that calling him the Great Black Dragon every time is too long. Also, he considers Elka and the Silver Wolves as part of his family, so he doesn't want them to go through any formalities and call him by his name. Elka accepts this suggestion, even though he still fumbles a bit and almost calls Seo Jun the Black Dragon again. The other wolves are also happy to hear that Seo Jun called them family. Then, Seo Jun looks at the gray rabbits while a few climb on his lap and demand Quengi. The gray rabbits have some very useful job. One of them is an artist, the second is a wood craftsman, and the third is an architect. Seo Jun is impressed that they are technical experts, but before going into that, he wants to know more of their story. First, he verifies that they were running away from the farm that was exploiting them by climbing up the tower, and Elka saved them from their pursuer. He then asks what floor they ran away from, and one rabbit tells him that they came from the 55th floor. 
The father rabbit freaks out as he hears that they came from the 55th floor, startling Seo Jun and Theo. The father rabbit asks a gray rabbit if he was on the 55th floor until now. He rattles him as he asks him about the kingdom, the king, queen, and princess. Then he asks the rabbit what happened to the monsters. Seo Jun asks him to calm down and explain things so that he can also understand them. Meanwhile, the mother rabbit takes the poor gray rabbit out of her husband's hands. The father rabbit gets overshadowed by gloom as he begins reciting the story. A long time ago, the 55th floor was the kingdom of rabbits called the Red Ribbon Kingdom. Someone is a Dragon Ball fan, I guess. Seo Jun asks the father rabbit what he means by was. He is curious about the current state of the kingdom. The father rabbit says that several decades ago, the Red Ribbon Kingdom fell. Before that tragedy occurred, the Red Ribbon Kingdom of rabbits was a very peaceful place. They grew crops on rich land and consumed healthy food thanks to the white farmer rabbits. They also had beautiful architecture and culture because of the various artists and professionals. The rabbits lived peaceful lives because they had a lot of black warrior rabbits present to protect themselves. Then, one day, everything changed when a gigantic horde of murder hornet-like monsters attacked them. While the other rabbits ran away, one solitary black warrior rabbit stood his ground as the guardian of his people. Sadly, the efforts of the valiant rabbit were in vain. He met a tragic end underneath the broken statue of their greatest warrior. Not long after that, the prosperous Red Ribbon Kingdom fell into ruins. As the father rabbit finishes telling the most terrible story known to rabbit kind, he says that the monsters that destroyed their kingdom appeared out of nowhere in the chaos of destruction. The king, the queen, and the princess went missing, and the people who had no one to look up to were scattered. They tried to escape the place while surviving the monsters, and the rabbit couple were among the few lucky ones who succeeded. As Seo Jun thinks about the story, he realizes that it was indeed strange to find rabbits here on the 99th floor because it didn't look like a place suitable for them. The father rabbit tells him that they believed that the bug-type monsters swallowed the entire 55th floor and they would never have thought that there were still those who remained there. The gray rabbit adds to this story. He says that their family and remaining rabbits who could not escape the onslaught of the monsters through the passage were just waiting to be killed by the monster. But then, suddenly, for no evident reason, the monsters disappeared as rapidly as they had appeared. And, in the wasteland that once used to be their kingdom, someone was waiting for them. Elka angrily takes the name of Landlord Grid, the greedy wild boar. The gray rabbit shivers as he hears the fearsome name. He says that Grid commanded a massive wild boar tribe and called himself the Great Landlord. He took control of the 55th floor that had lost its owner, and that was how the exploitation of rabbits began. They were forced to become slaves under the watchful eyes of the wild boars. The Red Ribbon Kingdom was morphed into a large farm under Grid. Instead of the diverse activities that the rabbits did, this new farm just produced vast amounts of food. The Gray Rabbit says that they couldn't just stand it, and his friends begin to cry. Seo Jun tells them to calm down and asks them to take some rest first, because they have gone through a lot. He asks the Black Rabbit to lead them to the cave and lend them his bed. The Black Rabbit asks the Gray Rabbits to follow him, and along with his parents, he takes the gray rabbits into the cave. After they are gone, Seo Jun remembers that the guy who hired the wolves to look for the straw hat was also Grid. Elka affirms, saying that Grid is an extremely wealthy pig who exerts considerable influence over the tower through food. The wolf chieftain curses Grid, calling him a disgusting wild boar who exploits the residents of the 55th floor. He even thinks that the way he took advantage of an opening to usurp the 55th floor looked like it was intentional. Elka says that he is ashamed that they worked under him for the short time they did. Even Theo agrees with this. He says that most of the food in the tower is distributed through the Merchant Association. The cat merchant has heard that most of that food comes from Grid's farms. Now, Seo Jun is a bit nervous after learning this, and he asks Elka, if there is a possibility that Grid may come to the 99th floor. Elka replies that no matter how much he tries or how much money he sends, 
the greedy wild boar will never be able to reach here because there will be no mercenaries willing to escort him. Elka believes that most mercenaries are cowards who wouldn't dare face monsters stronger than them. Co Jun sighed, saying that he can rest assured for now because Grid won't be able to chase after the rabbits. Well, at the same time on the 55th floor, what was once the Palace of the Red Ribbon Kingdom has now turned into Grid's castle. Inside that, on his throne, sits the greedy pig named Grid. He yells at the two jackal mercenaries, daring them to repeat what they said to him once again. The terrified jackals tell him that the silver wolf, Elka, betrayed them and even took away the rabbits they were chasing after. The second jackal even shows his wound to his master. Grid's assistant remarks that Elka was not trustworthy in the first place, and Grid doesn't mind his betrayal. He scoffs, saying that once the food in the tower hits rock bottom, Elka will come crying and begging him to save his clan. He then asks his assistant if their preparations are going well. The assistant pig replies that they are suppressing the distribution of food throughout the tower. A few complaints have been raised by the merchant union, but it is still within their control. The greedy pig laughs, saying that things are going nicely. He begins drooling with a menacing grin as he says that this is an opportunity just like the one that allowed him to overtake the 55th floor decades ago. This reminds me of some billionaires we have on Earth, but I won't take any names. God says that this time, it won't end with just one kingdom and one floor. The entire tower will be in his hand. He begins laughing loudly, sending his spit and snot flying everywhere like the disgusting pig he is. Meanwhile, on the 99th floor, Seo Jun wakes up from a peaceful sleep and then wakes Theo who is sleeping next to him. Theo wants to sleep more, so Seo Jun heads towards the pond to freshen up. He is shocked by what he sees there. There is a wooden wash basin that draws water from the pond using a green onion pipe. Not only that, there is also a ladle that fills his heart with joy. As Seo Jun washes his hair, he wonders if the gray rabbits built this. He thinks that with this, he can easily wash his hair and even his back. Just then, he hears Theo shouting to get his attention. He leads Seo Jun to another corner of the cave where the mother rabbit is cooking food over a stone stove that comes with a wooden chimney. Right next to that is a perfect wooden dining table with spoons and chopsticks on it. Seo Jun is still trying to process it. Theo tells him that the rabbits made something this amazing. Not only did they make a stove that will make cooking safe and efficient, but they also made tables and utensils to eat the food properly. As Seo Jun is watching the spoon and chopsticks with awe, Theo shows him a bowl that the three rabbits made for him, and it even has his paw print on it. He has learned the names of the three rabbits, which are Pimik, Pipik, and Pirik. Theo says that they keep making something or another, saying that they are thankful to Seo Jun for letting them stay here. In the background, one gray rabbit is carrying a wooden log, while another is giving a blue cloth to the side rabbit. The gray rabbit says that this is his way to thank her for taking care of them yesterday, and it raises the scythe rabbit up. Seo Jun approaches the rabbits who thank him for letting them into his home. They say that they are still lacking in many things, but they still want to help him in any way they can with their ability. Well, Seo Jun just holds the hands of the rabbit because this was something he was looking forward to as well. He asks the rabbits if they would be willing to stay here and work for him. Soon after that, Seo Jun introduces the three gray rabbits named Pimik, Pipik, and Pirik, who are going to stay with them. They greet everyone and express their hope to get along well. The parent rabbits and their first-generation kids also welcome them warmly. Seo Jun mentions that now that they have some highly skilled craftsmen on their side, their farming will also improve by one whole level. The gray rabbits are pleased to hear that and assure Seo Jun that they will prepare everything they can. Seo Jun already has something on his mind and asks the gray rabbits if they can create houses for the white farming rabbits first. The new batch of baby rabbits has finally become adults, so they need some houses. On top of that, the gray rabbits also need some houses. The second generation rabbits are not going to do well on their own, to put it politely. Seo Jun knows that they need to be independent, but he can't count on them to build their own houses. One of them has dug a pit, and a second rabbit is sleeping there because he is satisfied with that. Nearby, another rabbit is hiding under a pile of leaves. 
The architect Gray Rabbit tells Seo Jun that it is his specialty to create homes for rabbits, so he can leave everything to him. Theo climbs on Seo Jun's shoulder, telling him that he also needs a mobile home, but Seo Jun reminds him that he has his bundle. The Gray Rabbits, alerted by this conversation, say that they can make a cat tower. After that, the rabbits notice San's green onion bedding and ask him if he also does not have a home. He replies that he just sleeps on green leaves because that is enough for him. The rabbit suggests that they should make a home for him too. Seo Jun is surprised to hear that and asks the rabbit if he can really create a home for him here. The rabbit says that it will be difficult to create a house fit for him inside the cave, but it will not be difficult outside the cave. On top of that, there are a lot of trees there, so they don't have to worry about the raw materials. Seo Jun is happy to hear this, and says that he would really love to have a home. He mentions that lately, he has been staying out of the cave quite a lot to look after his outdoor fields. On top of that, since he has a lot of allies there, including the mama bear, the minotaurs, and the silver wolves, he thinks that since they are all strong, his security is almost guaranteed. Seo Jun decides to leave the construction of the house to the architect Rabbit and asks him if there is anything he needs. The Rabbit says that they would prefer it if they could make some bricks for stronger houses. For that, they need some mud or fine sand, and they ask Seo Jun if they can find anything like that on the 99th floor. Thinking about mud, Seo Jun recalls the exact place where they can find it. He takes the Gray Rabbits straight to the Minotaur territory and asks them what they think about the mud here. The Rabbits find that the mud has just the perfect amount of moisture and there are also some dried leaves mixed in it. He claims that it will be the perfect material to make some bricks. Seo Jun is glad to hear that, but the Minotaur King is not. He asks Seo Jun why he needs the mud because this is food for the Minotaurs. Seo Jun tells him that they need to make a new deal. He says that the architect rabbit, Pimik, is going to teach them how to make bricks. He says that if they allow them to make bricks using it and supply the mud, they will get green onion leaves. The gluttonous Minotaur King doesn't let Seo Jun complete his sentence and specify the details. He excitedly takes the offer right away. He tells all his Minotaurs to stop eating the mud because then they won't have enough to make bricks. The Minotaurs are confused, but they obey their king. Seo Jun is satisfied and thinks that they will be busy for a while now. Well, he is indeed going to be very busy, and so are his friends. King uproots a tree to show off his strength to the little rabbits, and they are impressed. However, right behind him, his mother has easily plucked two big trees. The black minotaurs are also working as tractors to plow Jin's field, and the increased workforce of white farming rabbits further cultivates the plowed land and grows green onions on it. They use their rakes and shovels to create furrows in the ground while other rabbits use their respective watering cans to water the vast fields of crops growing outside. In between, the bear cub, Qing, and the wolf chieftain, Elka spar to become stronger, and Seo Jun just cheers them from the sideline. He pats King for his good performance and rewards him with his favorite snack, a bottle of honey. Even Elka starts drooling when he sees the bear cub drinking honey, and Seo Jun gives him a bottle too. While Elka is initially nervous, he accepts his generous gesture. Seo Jun then takes help harvesting crops from the chunky cart rabbit and the chunky rabbit of the second generation, whom we will now call Chunk 2. Seo Jun uproots a bunch of the newest and highest quality crop on his farm, which is the sweet pumpkin sun potato. Because the plots were blessed by his passive buffs, he harvests 15 sun potatoes in one go and gains a good deal of job experience, thanks to the various bonuses and experience gains. He levels up and gets a bonus stat. He is happy to get a lot of sweet potato sun pumpkins, but then complains that it is too hot. He kind of preferred it when there were no dialogues in between. Seo Jun uses his skill to create a cloud over his head to give him some shade from the sun. As he uses the skill, his proficiency in using it increases. He then looks at the huge pile of green onion leaves in front of him and says that while the rabbits are creating houses, he should also ask them to create a sturdy warehouse outside. Suddenly, Theo approaches him because he is planning to go down the tower. 
Now, he tells Seo Jun that he has packed a lot of cherry tomatoes from the cave just now. Seo Jun asks him if he still has some space in his merchant bundle. He wants to try selling the detoxifying green onions to the hunters too, because there might be some hunters who need them. Theo says that he will take 100 of the green onions for now, and Seo Jun tells him to do his best, and says that he should have a little snack before leaving. As Theo approaches the pile of green onion leaves, he wonders if it will even sell well. But since Seo Jun has never been wrong about business, he decides to trust him. Despite that, Theo isn't really fond of the green onions because they are a bit too pungent for his tastes. As he is taking his sweet time, Seo Jun tells him to come back as quickly as possible. Theo is distracted as he replies to him, and as he turns around to face Seo Jun while putting the green onions in his bag, he puts a bunch of sweet potato sun pumpkins in it as well. My reader instinct is telling me that this is going to lead to massive plot development. Unaware of his innocent mistake, Theo runs towards Seo Jun, and the Minotaurs also come there for snack time. Meanwhile, while something eventful is happening on the 67th floor of the tower, which is a dense forest with reptilian life form. A green frog sits on a tree branch, croaking without a worry, but then an arrow comes and pierces its head. The one who shot the arrow was a lizard man archer who planned to have a feast out of the dead frog. He climbs down to the dead frog, which is much larger than I expected. However, before he can start eating, a red bug monster comes there and starts eating the frog. It is the same monster that destroyed the 55th floor of the tower. The lizard man doesn't care, and he eats the monster as a source of protein. That would have been the end of the story if a huge horde of bug monsters were not present nearby. They give death stares to the sole lizard man, and then suddenly attack him. The poor lizard man can't do anything as they swarm him. As the bug swarm is done with him, there is no trace left of the lizard man, save for his bow and quiver in a crater on the ground caused by the attack of the bugs. The bug monsters fly deeper into the 67th floor, signaling a great disaster. Meanwhile, Alien suddenly gets some notifications while she is sleeping peacefully in her home. The notifications keep ringing and she is forced to wake up with irritation. She complains that she was finally able to get some good sleep, but now the system alert is blaring so loudly. I would say that I can relate but no one messages me. She decides to check the messages through the magic crystal ball, and they erupt all at once. Alien has more than 1,000 unread messages that freak her out. The message says that there are about 5.3 billion red locusts who have infiltrated the 67th floor of the tower. Alien freaks out even more on learning that the red locusts are back because they are monsters that invade the tower from the outside. It has been 100 years since the last time the locusts invaded the tower. At that time, Alien's grandfather was in charge and he somehow resolved the issue. Thanks to that, he was able to barely stop the destruction of the 55th floor. Back then, Alien used her manager's authority to connect to the external communication channels, but the system told her that it was unable to do so. Alien is frustrated now that she can't contact her grandfather for help. Suddenly, a system window pops up in front of her, telling her that 0.1% of the 67th floor has been devastated by the Red Locusts. Within a couple of seconds, she gets another message telling her that the number has increased to 0.2%. Now, Alien is utterly perplexed and wonders what she should do. However, she could not connect with him and panicked about how to deal with this situation. Back on the 99th floor, Seo Jun has started cooking. He has cut and cleaned the eel that the Black Warrior Rabbit had brought with him earlier and removed all its fat. By the way, isn't the eel too old to be fresh? Well, it isn't an issue for Seo Jun because the main thing he wants right now is the fat of the eel. He melts the fat in a thick pan and then places the eel's meat in it. The delicious aroma of fat turning the meat pieces golden and melting drives him crazy. Even Theo can't stop drooling on Seo Jun's shoulder because the fried eel looks so tasty. Just then, the side rabbit comes over and tells Seo Jun that she has cut up the sweet potatoes and potatoes, just like he had asked. Seo Jun thanks her and then places the fried eel meat on a platter. 
He picks up the diced potatoes and sweet potatoes and tells everyone to step away from the stove for some time because hot oil may splatter, which can be quite dangerous. However, Theo is already planning to taste the fried eel meat, and even the black warrior rabbit is curious to see what Seo Jun is cooking. Seo Jun tells him that he is going to make something even tastier than the honey potatoes, and the black warrior rabbit is stunned because he doesn't think anything could be tastier than honey potatoes. Well, Seo Jun asks them if they have ever heard of candied sweet potatoes because that's what he's going to prepare next. He drops the diced pieces of sweet potatoes into the eel fat to fry them. He is glad that he could get so much oil from the eel after frying its meat because this will be super useful. First, Seo Jun fries the sweet potatoes until they turn brown and crispy on the outside, and then he pours honey directly into the pan. He stirs and lets the honey simmer over the sweet potato cubes, and the result is some really juicy and appetizing candied sweet potatoes. I don't know about you, but I'm literally drooling. It turns out that candied sweet potatoes are also a recipe that can be registered in Seo Jun's cookbook. The system window shows that it has been registered, and Seo Jun has achieved the accomplishment of creating his second dish because of cooking it. Seo Jun's proficiency in cooking level one has also significantly increased. Everyone is looking at the delicious candied sweet potatoes and Theo and the black warrior rabbit can't stop drooling. Next, Theo asks Seo Jun to fry his fish like the potatoes too, and Seo Jun obliges and puts the whole piranha into the frying pan. The system window labels it as a fried piranha, but doesn't give it a recipe status. While Theo drools upon seeing the fried fish, Seo Jun is surprised that it was not counted as a recipe. He wonders what the standard is to consider something a recipe, and then decides to prepare candied potatoes too, while the oil is still hot. Seo Jun exclaims that finding recipes is fun, and Theo asks him to slather honey over his fish too. That's not going to be a really good combo, is it? After that, Seo Jun calls everyone to eat. Everyone is excited to see such a great amount of food before them, which includes many new items, too. The minotaurs eat their staple green onion leaves and say that eating food after hard work tastes the best. Meanwhile, the chunky rabbit is transporting carrots. The wolves also relish the fish and soup. Theo has also eaten his eel, and he cannot seem to even move now. He lies comfortably on Seo Jun's lap, and reminds him that he has to go down now. Theo also knows that he should get going now, so he tells the wolf employees to come with him. Before leaving, Theo notices a big platter of food next to Seo Jun and asks him why he is saving that. Seo Jun replies that he was saving it for Alien, but she is not answering no matter how much he tries to contact her. The food has gone cold, and on top of that, Seo Jun has to keep Queen Paws away from the food reserve for the tower manager. Theo asks him if Alien is sleeping right now, and he replies that it would be a relief if that were true because he feels that something is off. Seo Jun can only hope that nothing is going on with Alien. Well, he is just hoping against hope because Alien is overwhelmed handling the situation on the 67th floor. She is trying her best to open a communication channel outside the tower, but is failing with each attempt. The system turns red and tells her that it failed to connect to anyone, and Alien realizes that she cannot solve this problem with her power. Her dragon heart has barely started to heal, but that does not change the fact that she is incompetent as a tower manager. She buries her face in her palms, saying that she doesn't know what to do. The system windows in front of her boost this feeling of hopelessness, and there is another system window that constantly keeps her updated about how much damage the 67th floor has endured. Meanwhile, at the Merchant Passageway Central Management Headquarters, an emergency meeting has been called. Different species living in the tower have gathered together. Among them is the leader of the Wandering Merchant Association, Mason of the Fox Tribe. Then there is the leader of the Free Mercenary Association, Hannibal of the Tiger Tribe. And to top it off, there is the leader of the Magician Association and the most powerful mage in the tower, Iona of the Hamster Tribe. I have seen a lot of things, but I have never seen such a cute magician before. Well, there is also our fox inspector, Jarrus, among the guards of the meeting, or at least I think it is her, 
She is surprised to see Iona in the meeting because she has heard that the top seven magicians of the association usually never appear in public. However, there is another unusual thing here. The heads of the three main organizations in the tower have gathered in one place, and Jairus can only wonder what is going on. The fox merchant Mason starts the meeting by telling everyone that it has been a few days since the red locusts appeared on the 67th floor. According to the wandering merchants under his control, he has gained information that roughly two-thirds of the 67th floor has fallen to the red locusts. He explains that right now, the lizard men have put up the final frontier near the waypoint, and they are desperately defending it. Despite that, the situation is not easy. The tiger mercenary Hannibal asks him if the wandering merchant passageway is still under control. He wants to know the possibility of the red locusts infiltrating other floors through the, the passageway. Mason says that since red locusts are invaders from outside the tower, they cannot use the passageway since the tower won't allow intruders to do so. The passageway is safe, but that does not mean that the threat of the red locusts is not great. Mason says that if they reach the waypoint, they will try to reach other floors. Hannibal realizes that the 68th and 69th floors will be the first to fall. Other members at the meeting panic because those floors are one of the five major granaries of the tower. Those floors are where the Lizardman Kingdom's farm is located. At this rate, the Red Locusts are not a problem for the Lizardmen alone. Mason believes that a great famine might occur again, and some of the younger merchants are not aware of what he means. It is time for our cute hamster magician, Iona, to speak up. She says that the Great Famine occurred a few decades ago after the 55th floor was annihilated. She says that currently the granaries are distributed across several floors of the tower, but at that time, the Red Ribbon Kingdom of the Rabbits was the largest food supplier in the tower. She tells how the massive Red Locust invasion broke out, and as a result, the Red Ribbon Kingdom was destroyed. Iona then curses the wild boar. Grid, who squeezed through the gap in the defense and took control of the place. Mason asks her to calm down and says that Grid is a good man. First, he isn't a man, and second, he is not good by any means. However, Mason believes that Grid was the one who rebuilt the granary of the tower back then. Iona scoffs at his words. She asks the fox how he can call the greedy wild boar a good man when he is exploiting the rabbit tribe and shutting down all food distribution lines to the rest of the tower. Hannibal gets furious on hearing this and tells Iona that she is taking it too far, and Mason tries to calm him down. Suddenly, someone mentions the Black Dragon and asks if the Great Black Dragon, who is supposed to protect them, is going to take any action. Everyone thinks that they don't need to worry because the Black Dragon will come to save them. Iona just sighs at their ignorance. She hops from her seat and lands on the table, telling everyone that 200 years ago, and several thousand years ago, the Red Locusts had infiltrated the tower. At that time, the Great Black Dragon protected the tower, and the Red Locusts were annihilated quickly. However, the last time the Red Locusts appeared on the 55th floor, for some unknown reason, the Black Dragon did not step in to solve the situation quickly. The situation was fixed only after half of the kingdom's citizens were wiped out. Iona says that the disaster that took place then still affects the world, and many places have not yet fully healed from it. She claims that at this time, it has only been a few days since the Red Locust invasion started, and there is no guarantee that the Black Dragon is going to appear quickly this time. She declares that they should stop the Red Locusts with all their might until the Black Dragon appears. Otherwise, the Order of the Tower will collapse. Iona declares that under her command, the Magic Tower will dispatch 200 war mages to deal with the situation. She asks the other leaders of the tower what they are going to do. While the only thing he could think of was how to erase proof of his greatest blunder, meanwhile, on the 99th floor, Seo Jun is frantically searching for the sweet potatoes and the heap of green onion leaves. He can't find a single one of the sweet potatoes and is in full panic mode because of it, almost like me when I can't find my iPhone. C.O. Jun screams that he has to plant a new batch of sweet potatoes, but there is no way to do it now. 
he clutches his hair tightly as he freaks out that the recently harvested sweet potatoes have vanished into thin air. He suddenly gets the realization that Theo might have something to do with it. However, he doesn't suspect the cat merchant of taking them away. Instead, he believes that Theo must have safely transplanted the sweet potato shoots to another location while he was busy harvesting the green onions. SEO Jun complains that he wanted to try a couple of them and decides to punish Theo for taking action on his own when he returns. I am willing to bet $100 that Theo will get his position as the permanent sales cat snatched from him when Seo Jun learns the truth. Well, there is something else to distract him from the issue right now. The seed store window opens up in front of Seo Jun, who suddenly realizes that one month has passed since the last time the seed store opened. He had forgotten about it as usual. Seo Jun decides to check up at the seed store, which shows him four kinds of random seeds. At his current level, Seo Jun can purchase as many seeds as he wants with a maximum expenditure of five tower coins. This time, the seeds on offer are 100 strawberry seeds for 0.5 tower coins, 5 Chinjang pepper seeds for 0.5 tower coins, and 20,000 carrot seeds for 4 tower coins. Well, that nicely adds up to the 5 tower coin limit, but there is also a fourth and rather remarkable option. This time, it is just one flame bean seed, which is worth a full 5 tower coins. Seo Jun is quite curious about the flame bean seed because just one seed costs a whopping five tower coins. Well, money is not a constraint for our filthy rich, but he is worried about the condition that he can only buy seeds worth five tower coins at a time. He thinks that if he buys the flame bean seed, he won't be able to buy anything else. The risk is too big to take, despite the fact that that the flame bean seed will definitely be worth its price. SEO Jun decides not to take a risk this time and picks up the things he is familiar with. He selects the strawberry seeds and the pepper seeds because they will give him the familiar flavor he is yearning for. Also, since there are more rabbits in his care now, he needs more carrots to feed them, so he buys the carrot seeds too. Buying the three items fulfills the limit of five tower coins and the system verifies SEO Jun's purchases and deducts the money from his account. It also gives him 50 seed store mileage points, and now he has a total of 56 seed store mileage points. The system thanks him for using the seed store, and then the window vanishes. The seeds fall into Seo Jun's hand in the same old luxury pouches, and he is happy that he has a lot of things to plant now. Just the thought of eating strawberries and the local Chin Jang pepper revitalizes him. He approaches the daddy rabbit and tells him that he has bought more carrot seeds from the seed store. The father rabbit is astonished to hear this good news. Seo Jun says that they should quickly plant them and asks the father rabbit if he can leave this work to him. The rabbit is eager to help him and tells him to leave everything to him. Seo Jun tells him that they will keep expanding their fields above ground and asks him to cheer up so the rabbit dad does exactly that. Meanwhile, in the real world, in the city of Gangnam, where the tower is located, the weather is nice. The old man Tai Jun, who is the former head of the Phoenix Guild and Kim Dong Shik's mentor, is on the rooftop. He admires the fresh air and the view of the tower because it has been a long time since he came out of his refrigerator-like room. He asks his student Si Hyuk if he doesn't agree with him, and he replies that he doesn't know too much about that. However, he takes this chance to remind his master that he is not in a condition to be outside. He tells Taejin that if he lets his guard down, the curse of the flame affecting his body may spread. He asks him to go inside for his and everyone else's safety, but Taejin is not happy. He says that Si-hyuk has gotten better at ruining his mood and asks about his personality type according to the MBTI test. Taejin doesn't care about that silly test or zodiac signs. Taejin then moves on to the important thing and remarks that they will soon be having a deal with the wandering merchant, Theo. He asks Si Hyuk if Dong Sik is on the 37th floor right now, and he affirms. He also adds that Dong Sik is having difficulty conquering the boss of the 38th floor, which is the deadly tarantula. The boss monster has created its nest at the waypoint, which is why the hunters cannot go to the next floor. One of the biggest reasons for that is that the poisonous gas released by the tarantula is difficult to neutralize, even with healing magic. 
Most hunters claim that it is impossible to enter the nest without an antidote made from the blood of the poison spider, which is the servant guarding the nest. Moreover, finding an alchemist who can prepare the antidote is also very difficult. Taijun realizes that this is the reason Dong Sik's team has not made any progress in the tower. He then asks Si Yuk if he is the one who is guarding Seo Jun's family while Dong Sik is in the tower. The old man asks him to report to him if anything happened. Si Yuk says that ever since Seo Jun's family has been moved to the Hanum province, they are constantly being watched by bodyguards. Also, since they want to live their lives normally like before, the guards are monitoring them from a safe distance so they are not bothered by them. Si Hyuk reveals that recently there was an attempt by a foreign association to get close to them. They sent some attractive TikTok models to lure Seo Jun's younger brother, Seidol, so that he could let them get closer to Seo Jun. However, Sadol's friends made sure that he didn't give the girls his contact information or go out drinking with them. Wait, why does one of the guys look exactly like Seo Jun? Well, Taijun laughs upon hearing the reports, but that laughter turns into a cough. Si Hyuk is worried about him. But Taijun tells him that he is fine as he pops a magical cherry tomato that looks like a small candy in his hands. Seek asks if that was a cherry tomato, and the old man affirms. He says that after eating the cherry tomatoes, overcoming the curse of the flame has become much smoother for him. He says that tomatoes are a very useful item and they are quite tasty as well, so they will surely help a lot of people in the future. That is why Tae Jun believes that Seo Jun is a talent that they should not let go of. He begins walking back to his room while telling Si Hyuk to remind Dong Sik that he promised to bring Seo Jun to his office once he comes out of the tower. He laughs for no reason as he goes inside. Si Hyuk watches him, wondering if the old man finally went inside. However, he trusts that there is definitely a way to release the curse of the flame affecting his master, and he is sure that if the task is up to Dong Sik, he will find a cure at all costs. Well, right now, Dong Sik is in the dungeon fighting a horde of spider monsters. The monsters keep coming no matter how many he kills, and he realizes that it won't be possible to defeat them all. He tells his teammates to retreat and regroup, but then one of his teammates yells at Dong Sik that there is a spider above him. It is too late for Dong Sik to react as the spider is already about to pierce his head, but then suddenly a woman leaps towards the spider to save Dong Sik. The woman is none other than Suha, Theo's number one fan, and she blocks the spider's attack with her sword, but gets a drop of its poison on her face. She pushes the spider's claws away and then draws out her lightsaber-like sword to stab it in the head. The spider strains and struggles as it dies soon. The rest of the crew comes to them and asks Dong Sik and Suha if they are all right. Dong Sik tells them that Suha got hit by the spider's venom and the healer tries casting healing magic on her. It doesn't work and Suha is still struggling to stay alive. The healers tell Dong Sik that they can only stop the spread of the poison, and if they stop casting the healing magic, the poison will begin spreading again. Dong Sik and others search their pouches and find that they have used all their antidotes. They don't have time to run to an alchemist to buy more and wonder what to do. Suddenly, Theo arrives there, looking for Dong Sik. Theo asks him why he is here and not waiting at the usual trading place. Dong Sik is taken aback to see him, and he takes a moment to recall that today was trading day. He had forgotten about it because he was too occupied with the battle. Theo then notices Suha on the ground and asks Dong Sik why his underling is sleeping on the bare ground. He gets on her chest and tells her to get up because he needs to take some selfies with her. Even though they are barely holding together, Suha still compliments Theo's fur. Dongsik tells the cat merchant that Suha was affected by the spider's poison, and he understands that she must be in pain. He keeps his paws on her face while telling her to keep resting. Dongsik tells Theo that at this rate, the girl will lose her life and asks him if he knows of a place that sells antidotes. Theo replies that there are no alchemists nearby, but then he remembers that he is the hero's assistant, so he has some heavy plot armor on his side. He begins rummaging through his bundle as he tells Dong Sik that he has something. He brings out the detoxifying green onions with a dude in sound effect, 
and tells the hunters what they are. Dongsik can't believe that Theo has a detoxifying green onion, and he immediately begins reading its information window. He finds that the cat was not lying, and the onion can detoxify any poison of grade D or lower for one hour when consumed, and the effect can be stacked ten times per hour. Dongsik realizes that the green onion can really detoxify the spider's poison. He helps Suha up and asks her to eat the onion stem. She munches on it lazily, and suddenly the poison damage on her face vanishes, just like her lethargy. She exclaims that her body has gotten unbelievably lighter. Theo clings to her leg and says that it is a relief. Suha grabs him and starts cuddling with him. She thanks him for saving her life and calls him the best cat. Theo acts proud and says that this was nothing. I don't know why, but I ship Theo with Suha. But please don't cancel me for this. Well, Theo is not going to be sidetracked from the main love of his life, which is making money. He tells Suha to give him five tower coins in exchange for the green onion and says that he will keep them cheap because she is a friend. In response, she only calls him a villain merchant. Then Dongsik approaches him and asks him where he got the detoxifying green onion. Theo simply replies that it is a new crop that he's selling. Dongsik freaks out on hearing that because it makes him feel that the god of plot armor is on his side as well. The deadly tarantula poison is just a B-plus grade, and with the detoxifying green onion, raiding the 38th floor will become much easier. Even Dongsik thinks that Theo is the lucky golden cat, but Theo is kind of annoying by the way he is looking at him. 